The following is for information only and should not be the basis for an investment decision. Today I'm joined by Porig Dempsey for a conversation with Peter Keeling, the founder and CEO of Aimlisted Diasutics. Porig has a strong track record in healthcare commercialization, working previously at a senior level at UDG and as Chief Commercial Officer at Dublin-based Unifar. Diasutics is a diagnostics commercialization company operating a novel platform called DXRX that connects pharmaceutical companies with diagnostic labs, enabling patients to get more efficient access to modern precision medicines. DXRX sits at the intersection of life science and data science, providing the plumbing that enables the long-term journey to personalize medicine. I found it very difficult to edit this conversation as the content is so rich and interesting. I set the scene by asking Peter how Diasutics operates and the problems it solves for its customers. Porek dives into the commercial fundamentals and asks Peter how Diasutics has built a moat around its business and helps us understand how sustainable this moat might be. In today's episode, we learn about precision medicine, the journey to personalized health, the complexities of accessing siloed healthcare data, and building and commercializing data sets that help patients find the best modern treatment for their condition. It is a fascinating conversation. Peter started in traditional pharma, but transitioned into a serial entrepreneur after a stint at MIT. 20 years later, he is providing the tools for the world's largest pharmaceutical companies to transform the healthcare industry from mass market treatments to personalized therapies. Please enjoy our conversation with the maverick, Peter Keeling. Hi, Peter. Thanks for joining us today. Can you tell us about your background and your journey into diaceutics? I suppose I think of my work career as kind of starting in earnest and um, working for the Wellcome Foundation are now obviously part of GlaxoSmithKline. And I had a wonderful set of experiences at Wellcome. Normally, when you start in the pharmaceutical industry, they give you a car and say, okay, your patch is woking, visit doctors. I was given Cairo and told that there were 11 people in the Cairo office and I was the grand title of the North African liaison officer, which sounded a little bit like something out of the foreign office. One thing that really struck me then, even as a young, naive executive in the industry, was that you can have the best medicines in the world, like an an eye ointment, for example, that we used to sell, you know, a $9 product. But a $9 product might have saved a life of an Egyptian or, or anybody, but that was a month's salary for many people. And a job came up within the Wellcome Foundation in Indonesia. And like many things in my life, I think I was the third choice. You know, the other two didn't want the job. And I stuck my hand up and said, yeah, I'll go. You know, I was dropped really into a team. I was the commercial director there. It was 175 people strong. I had three sales divisions working underneath me. You know, I really enjoyed the ability to launch new products really quite rapidly for the then welcome division of what was the largest South New Pacific Rim subsidiary. And so I was called back to London for a couple of years, which again, really fortunate to watch the beginning of the rollout of the antivirals, the first antivirals into the pharmaceutical market. And you have to admire, and I do admire the pharmaceutical model, that when it focuses on a disease, it can really change the arc of that disease. You know, as I left Welcome to take a gap year at MIT, I really look back at my years inside that pharmaceutical company with huge fondness and a real taking me from a greenhorn all the way through to somebody who at least understood how the business model worked. Spent a year at MIT. Again, (laughs) this was a visiting fellowship where you're plugging in at the Sloan School. And I always describe it now as my gap year at the age of 34. So I enjoyed the time at MIT. I did start to really think about the diagnostic 
paradigm at MIT. I started to look at why would an industry that is in charge of 70% of all decision making, namely diagnostic testing, generate only 3% of the dollars. It felt to me there was something wrong with that. As I left MIT with with a almost silent agreement of my wife, I said, I want to set up a business. Um, and I set up a company called Diagnology, which was a seven-year journey, venture capital-backed business, building diagnostic tests for the sexually transmitted disease industry. And it was tough. It was really, really hard because diagnostics is a tough business model. I used to have what I would call my, oh, my God days. Um, oh, my God, it works like this. Or, oh, my God, it takes this long. Um, as I departed that business after seven years, sold the technology on, I was sort of, okay, the theory behind testing as being really transformative for healthcare is right, but somehow building a diagnostic company is not the right way to do it. And that's really what led to diacetics. I took a year to sort of figure out what was the right entry point to unlocking this kind of diagnostic paradigm, this way of treating and testing patients better. And that's what led to me kind of converging my experiences back to the pharmaceutical industry. And I I remember presenting what was a return on investment model at a meeting in Orlando. I paid for myself to go along to this pharmaceutical marketing meeting. And I was given the last slot on the last day. So I was sort of pleased when there were 50 people in the room listening to my hypothesis at about how diagnostic testing and investment in diagnostic testing within the pharmaceutical industry would drive more market share, would drive more patients onto their drug. But as people got up and left the room, you know, you go through that moment of, do I stop? Do I continue? So I continued, finished, seven people left in the room, two of whom walked up, one from Glaxo, one from AstraZeneca and said, this is really interesting. Can you operationalize this? And thus was born Diacetics some 18 years ago. You talk a lot about precision medicine. Can you just explain to me what precision medicine is? The world that we've all grown up in has largely been fueled by tablets or or whatever it is, treatments which are described as one size fits all. In essence, we will give this tablet to as many people as possible on the basis that those patients, the majority of those patients will respond. What has happened over the years is that we've realized that often only 40 or 50% of the patients will respond to those drugs and the rest have to then go on to an alternative treatment. So it's almost a trial and error. What's happening within precision medicine is that we're able to test patients at a much more molecular level and therefore then says, okay, this patient is more likely to respond to this particular drug and let's target that patient or give a very precise treatment to that patient to make sure that this drug works better. And what that has done in many ways is created a revolution in patient outcome and that is the more targeted you can be to that patient's molecular or genetic makeup, the more likely that drug is to work really well. And we've got almost 200 examples now of drugs on the market where testing and treatment have been combined in this way to create a very precise intervention for patients. And it's super to see, and it's absolutely a byproduct of the Human Genome Project, which of course is now decades old, but we're now beginning to see those first medicines come to market where we're really targeting patients at that genetic level. So this is a journey to personalized medicine where we each get our own therapeutic treatment. It is. And you use the word journey. And I think, you know, in healthcare, a lot changes, but it doesn't necessarily change really quickly. So yes, I think we're on a 30 or 40 year paradigm shift towards the personal treatment for individual patients. Today, we are still trying to find those genetic subtypes. You know, there could be a quarter of breast cancer patients who will respond to a particular drug or 12% of lung cancer patients who will respond to a particular drug. So it's finding those subsets and treating them with these new drugs. That's sort of where we're at at the minute. So I think you'll begin to answer my next question, but how does diacetics in this problem solve issues for your customers? What I realized back in running a diagnostic company is how difficult 
driving adoption of new diagnostics is. And so what you're really having here is this new dependency between testing and treating patients is a business that's out of sync with one half of that, namely the testing half. So what I saw back in the foundation of diagnostics was if you could work with the pharmaceutical companies to get them to realize that an investment, a very targeted investment in the diagnostic ecosystem or the diagnostic pathway, as I describe it today, would really open up access for patients who would otherwise be missed that would then get onto their drug. And what I think we've built around diagnostics kind of key pillars of helping the pharmaceutical industry do that in a much more simplified way. It's still complex to do, but I think what we've done is to break it down into bite-sized chunks. And our platform, DXRX, is really a combination of easy-to-use modules that allow a therapy team that's launching a new drug that's dependent upon testing to really break this down and make sure that the patients are being tested at the right time so that they therefore can be treated at the right time. Does that make the patient more involved in their own diagnosis and treatment? Is that the way we're going? It seems to be the case. It is. I think we're in what I would describe as a bit of a middle era of precision medicine or personalized medicine. And that middle era is we're still having an industrial conversation with ourselves, i.e. we're still trying to build the plumbing to make this all work smoothly. We're still trying to get the right drugs to the market. That's obviously on the shoulders of the pharmaceutical industry. New tests are coming forward. Laboratories are being supported to try and adopt these tests in a faster way. And so that plumbing system still isn't working in the way that we need it to do. But in the longer run, I think you are right. I think ultimately, and there are other people like Rick Carlson and others way back in 2009 and saying, ultimately, personalized medicine will end up being driven by patients themselves. And it makes enormous sense. And we did a piece of research where we were sort of observing the conversation in cancer and other disease forums. And it's a very simple observation to make. And that is patients talk about testing and testing options four times more than they talk about treatment. And that's natural. You know, what is it I have? And I have to go for another test and what's going on here. And so, Patients are naturally engaged in their testing. The problem is, is that it all feels a little bit like it's behind a firewall. It's remote from us as individuals. Yet, when you stand back and look at, you know, we're able to book our own flights ourselves. We're able to do our own banking online ourselves. We're even being able to turn into kind of advertisers through social media ourselves. So there is no impediment really to us being able to take as individuals, take control of our diagnostic journey. The issue is, is the plumbing ready to do that? And I think we're still about 10 years away from that plumbing being ready to engage patients in a meaningful way and allow them to take action. You know, we could talk tomorrow morning to patients and saying, hey, you need to be better tested and here's a new test. The question that patient will ask is, where do I go to get that test? What does the answer mean? Which physician will test me that way? Those are things that we need to fix first. And I think that's what we're doing with our pharmaceutical customer base is to fix those things so that ultimately that patient engagement will be seamless. It's still about five to 10 years away, I think. You need changes in the medical profession as well as the pharmaceutical industry, don't you? You do. Remember, again, if I really appeal for a moment of empathy, everybody in healthcare is really busy, really stretched. Physicians, labs, even those within industry, we're all working at full tilt to try and get these systems, these very siloed and disintermediated systems to work together. And so, yes, there need to be changes at every single one of those. However, again, come back and look at this the other way around. And that is, if you can persuade or educate or support a physician with testing choices that are better, that physician will use those testing choices. If you can bring to a lab the ability to test patients the better way, that lab wants to do that. They're all migrating to quality. Can we just dive in a bit into Diaceutics and your DXRX platform, just giving us an idea of the scale of it and how it delivers value to the pharmaceutical companies and the diagnostic companies? The first pillar is what I would describe as data. We realized early on that one of the issues was that 
nobody really had a handle on where patients were being missed, how broken the diagnostic ecosystem was. Today, we now know with our data sets that over 65% of patients are not getting access to these drugs because the testing ecosystem isn't working. So ironically, the drug might be there, but 65% of patients aren't getting access to that drug because of testing. Now, it's taken us a decade more to build that data set and build it with confidence and evidence. But we can see those pictures at a disease level, even at a regional level of what is happening. So data has been a really important part of opening hearts and minds to changing behavior. The second thing that we've put into the XRX platform is an engagement with labs. Again, on our journey, we kind of looked around and saying, who is the stakeholder that can change things really quickly? Who is sitting at the front line of testing? And it's actually interesting. It's not diagnostic technology companies. They are a supplier in many ways into the system. It's labs sitting within our hospitals. It's commercial labs, a very, very fragmented group. We've databased over 70,000 labs in 15 countries that are doing some type of cancer testing. That very fragmented base is really important to bring together and create that collaboration of the willing to change something. So if you think the data will highlight where the problems are, we're able to collaborate with those labs to fix those problems. Why is that important? If you look at the time lag of adoption of a new test, which I mentioned earlier on, anywhere between 4, 10, 15 years to drive adoption of a new diagnostic. What we believe we can do with that lab network is to drive that adoption in under 10 months. Now, there'll still be groups of patients that we're not reaching, but the majority of patients we can reach by really collaborating with those labs and supporting those labs. The last bit is the platform itself. We could run our data business and our lab network business as kind of separate functions, but the real value is to put that into a platform which, from a business point of view, helps us scale as a company, but from a customer point of view, really starts to use digital transformation to give instant access to that data, whether it be through dashboards or conversion right onto pharma systems, and instant access to those labs to observe how they are changing practice when we help them every single day. So the platform is our way of giving visibility, if you like, to the change that we see that needs to take place on the ground in all of these diseases. So it's a big system play, but that's what we knew we needed. And that's what our pharmaceutical customers have come to expect from us. We're building that platform to cover at least the rollout of these new drugs in 15 countries and beyond, working with those labs as our partners on the ground, if you like, to really create the change at the front line. Just sticking with the data one, right? Because, you know, having been in this space and trying to provide insights across multiple data streams, you mentioned the kind of two and a half thousand labs. How do you maintain a kind of a competitive advantage for diaceutics in gathering that data? Are you currently adding value to the labs or how are you hoping to even add more value in the future? It must be about 20 odd years ago, Google launched an online health record. It's called Google Health. And you had to go in and you had to submit your own patient records. I'm probably one of the six people who did that on the basis that here was Google coming along and it's going to join all these data sets and we will have connected information flows. I think Google Health was one of those things that lasted about six months. So somewhere in the annals of Google Health or my little patient record that I volunteered. Why did Google Health not work? And the simple answer is that testing data, health data in general, but testing data in particular, is sits in so many different silos. What we've done, and I think stage one of that competitive advantage that you're alluding to, Porik, is, is basically just source those data, bring them out of their libraries and see how we can connect them so that we can create the visibility over what I describe as these diagnostic journeys. Let me take an example of in lung cancer. So today in lung cancer, we have over 13, 14 million patients looking at non-small cell lung cancer. So when I say patients, patient data, and we're able to see 
having connected those data sets, that a lung cancer patient, and there's no such thing as a typical patient, they're all atypical, but by and large at an epidemiological level, you can see how a patient can travel from cough to a targeted drug in four years during which time they might have had 10 different testing events, whether it be an x-ray, a biopsy, blowing into a peak flow meter, all of which may have been a missed opportunity to test that patient better and get them onto treatment. And of course, what is happening to their cancer is that it's moving from stage one to stage two, all the way through to metastatic disease. So we see that in the data. We've only been able to see it by pulling the data from all those disparate sources. And then lastly, we are working with our labs on the ground to do these kind of collaborations where we're fixing things. And the exhaust data that comes out of fixing those things brings back further information into that patient record. So very fragmented, very siloed, hard to integrate. I think that's the first thing that we've cracked, and that has been part of our secret sauce. Many of our pharmaceutical customers can get access to pieces of this information. They are huge businesses, yet it's the data science that takes that from its fragmented pieces, puts it together, makes sense of it, validates it, and then is able to bring that forward into a dashboard that is days old. So you're finding patients where they were tested positive in the last few days. That's a very, very sophisticated approach. It's taken us about 13, 14 years to build that piping, that infrastructure in order to do that. I think it's hard to replicate. It's not impossible, but it's really hard to replicate. And of course, we're in a rolling situation now. We're adding multiple diseases on there. We're moving beyond oncology into other diseases, cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disease, to try and build these pictures. One thing I would say that we've learned in working with the pharmaceutical industry is that once you build trust with the data that you're bringing forward is a resemblance of the truth, i.e. it's providing a really good snapshot of what's going on in that patient testing journey. They're asking you, can you do that in not just in the United States, can you do it in the UK, can you do it in Germany, can you do it in France? So we're building global data sets. They're asking us, can you give us that data so that it's not six months old or even three months old or a month old, but it's a week old. Again, these are things that we've built in to create that level of service. So if we're putting a dashboard of data in front of our customers today, they're looking at data that could be three or four days old. And that, I think, is a real competitive moat around our business. If a client came to you and said, look, we're moving into a new therapeutic area and it's requiring this form of diagnostic testing and they wanted you to map it, roughly how long would it take Diaceutics to pull that together? Is it a six-month project, a six-week project? How does it look from that start point? If you'd asked me that three years ago before the platform, it was six weeks. Today, literally, assuming we have that data in our system, which for the majority of the pipeline products coming towards us, we do, it's a 60-second process. So in 60 seconds, you're able to see how many labs can run that data. Ideally, we're working with therapy teams a couple of years before they're launching these drugs. And we're encouraging them to ask those types of questions. Start by asking, if you have a brand new diagnostic or it's slightly unique or there's some difference to this test than those that exist in the market, start by asking the question, how many labs can actually run this test? And you'll often find what we call in diastatics, there's a shock and awe moment where that therapy team, understandably unfamiliar with how these patients are being tested because that's not their business, find that they know that maybe three, four, five hundred labs ultimately will be needed to support their drug forecasts, but there could be seven labs globally that can run this test. I mean, that is a huge wake up moment. So it's a 60 second shock, followed by all sorts of other data to try and support moving the needle. Peter, at the start of the conversation, you talked about the importance of operationalizing these kind of innovative ideas. Can you just describe briefly what the sales cycle with your pharmaceutical client looks like? It is you're in talking about the lab mapping, and then they understand you can do physician mapping, and then they do the, the DX or XIG. Does it vary from client to client? That sales cycle, what does it usually look like from your perspective? It varies really depending on when you engage the customer. If you give me the license, I'm going to describe a perfect customer. So a perfect customer comes to us two years before they're launching 
the drug. So they've been maybe alerted by their R&D colleagues that the FDA is looking favorably on the approval of this drug and that the drug will be dependent upon a new or a novel biomarker. And the first thing that happens, just as you described a minute ago, Porik, and that is we are running a lab mapping. That We start with what exactly is the landscape out there for testing for this existing test? And on the assumption that we have some labs, but not many, already running that test. The next question is, okay, what is our strategy here to really drive adoption? And often that customer might not know that there are other pieces of information that they need to, for example, they need to know what's the physician testing behavior, even though you might have a physician who is predisposed to writing a lot of prescriptions, they may not be predisposed to doing a lot of testing on that particular patient group. So we map that out for them as well and show them what the prescriber behavior looks like. A third component to that is we're then providing them with an overarching strategy that will support the forecasts that they have for that drug. So if they need to get 10,000 patients onto drug in their forecast for the first year, we can reverse that back out and saying, okay, you're going to need 80 labs in the United States, 20 labs in the European theater. That's what you need to target. And of course, straight after that, then comes the question, so who's going to do this for us? Who will drive those labs or enable those labs to adopt that new test. And that's where, again, we stick our hand up at Diastatics and saying, okay, we have a lab network. It just so happens that the 180 labs that we believe that you're going to need for the first year or so of your forecasts are already on our network. We've engaged with them. We understand what they need in order to drive adoption of the test. And we will trigger a module which we call lab engage and physician engage to really support those labs whether the lab needs new training whether the lab needs support with bad reimbursement or inadequate reimbursement of that test all of these hurdles as we describe them in diastatics and those hurdles vary by country and by disease all of those hurdles are in front of us and we work with those labs to eliminate or reduce those hurdles as much as possible that results in labs adopting the test and adopting it relatively quickly. Again, think of this just for a second through the lens of a lab. We're coming through the door of a lab and saying, here's a brand new test. There's going to be a billion dollar drug hanging off the back of that, but you're only going to be required to do a hundred of these patients in a year. And the lab will say, well, why should I do that? What's the value to me in doing that? And so we have to work with those labs on what we call a value for value basis where we're really supporting those labs understand why this is good for their business as well as their patients and their physicians. And then we're back to the data again. And finally, the data will show us how many labs have adopted that test and indeed how many patients are being tested positive. Starting with data, moving through lab engagement and ending with the data is the sort of the life cycle. And then it's rinse and repeat because obviously we've only got the first 180 labs on and ultimately we're going to have to have the next 180 and the next 180. We're living with these therapy teams for anything up to six or seven years, which is the record that we have at the minute, holding their hand as they bring on new indications for that drug, where again, you might need a different testing paradigm or they're moving into a different geography where again, you need to repeat the whole process. That's sort of the long life cycle of living with our pharmaceutical customers. That answered the next phase where I was kind of on where can you work? How do you really prolong that relationship with the pharmaceutical company? But obviously with the various different indications right across the life cycle, you are working with these companies for a prolonged period. You mentioned at the start that 18 years ago in Florida, two companies came up to AstraZeneca and GSK at the very end to see if you could operationalize. Do you still work with either of those companies? I'd like to think that we didn't lose them. The way we look at it is there are kind of the top 20 pharmaceutical customers are our customers. If you were to do Google who are the top 20 pharma, you'll see them there. So they are our customers. Many of those customers, we're working with multiple therapy teams within those customers. And so again, remember pharma is, I would describe it, they're as fussy as the Pentagon and NASA. Understandably so. I mean, they have patient lives hanging off the back of the decisions that they're making. So they want to work with partners where they have a trusted track record. They're bringing forward validated information, validated insights, and they're bringing extraordinary value to the table. The reason why 
I think we've held on to and continue to build that customer base is because we have been our own worst critic. We've constantly tried to say, what do our customers need next? And often, interestingly, the thing that they need next is not something the pharmaceutical industry necessarily knows or believes. It's not like there's a playbook here in front of them that they're working to. So often our conversations with them are, you need to release more budget to do this because otherwise you're going to miss your forecasts. And again, this has to come with a very trusted relationship with those customers. So I think we're building that customer base. We're holding on to that customer base. And then to that, we're adding kind of a long tail of mid-sized and other biotech companies who are bringing forward precision medicines with exactly the same set of needs. Again, the science is unfolding rapidly, and out of that are a raft of new biotech startups. You know, when people say to me, why did you need to bring a platform here to do this? And I'm a huge fan of quintiles are now the IQVIA business model. You know, I, I sort of feel to a certain extent diacetics is is the precision medicine play that IQVIA quintiles was in clinical research all those 30 odd years ago. And of course, what IQVIA have done is to build their skill by adding people. That was a choice that we could make. We could add people in diacetics, but instead supported by our IPO on the London markets, we said, let's reinvent ourselves enabled by a platform, not enabled by adding a cast of thousands. That scale that I think we need today and increasingly will need tomorrow. I mean, we're looking at a two to threefold increase in the number of precision medicines coming to market in the next five years. The last thing I wanted to do was to build acidics and then lose the momentum that is in that pipeline. You've really explained clearly the value that you bring to the pharma market in really making sure that patients are getting access to the right treatments. If I look at the other side, right, one of the biggest challenges going forward is how do governments pay for some of these new medicines? We've all seen the reports, $2 million per patient, et cetera. Have you any examples of where you've been working with the government or is it in your vision for the future where you could actually work more with the payer on ensuring that patients are getting the access to the right treatments? Because we all know like the most expensive treatment is the one that doesn't work. I think the pharmaceutical industry is the one that has demonstrated its ability and its willingness to step in and create change at a level. And it has, if you like, the urgency. It has the burning fire because it's launching these drugs. In marked contrast, the payer industry and the insurance industry has been much more reactive. And whilst the same data sets, to answer your question, that we have for pharmaceutical industry absolutely are useful, highly useful to that insurance and that payer industry. In many ways, they want the whole thing kind of mapped out for them. And the payers are asking a slightly different question. Show me where filling and addressing those testing gaps will help me save money and ultimately will help those patient outcomes. And often within the insurance industry, and show me how that's going to do that within two to three years, because that's the time that I'm covering that patient. That's a really tough question. The way I think of that, Porik, is that our data is highly useful to help and support governments and insurance systems look at where they are losing money. We published a paper together with our customers and other stakeholders, the Personalized Medicine Coalition last year called the Practice Gaps, where we validated a hypothesis that we've been putting out in Dacetic for years that patients were missing because of bad testing. And the answer, I think, as I alluded to already, is 64% of patients not getting access to these drugs. Now, the corollary of that is that 64% of those patients were then treated with something else. And that something else probably was more costly. It led to more side effects. And more importantly, it was an inferior choice for those patients. Now, that's relevant to payers. But in order to get that level of engagement so that the payer will step in and create a intervention on one treatment in that particular geography, that is the tough part. I remain optimistic. I genuinely remain optimistic. And we do talk to large partners who have a much greater handle on what's happening with the insurance industry. So I'm optimistic that the data that we have will be useful. But it's a whole other kind of division of diacetics that I think we'd need to build right now. There's, as I said, a two to three fold increase in the number of drugs coming to market. I think Diacetics has pretty much got its focus set for the next couple of years. 
you're a life scientist, you become a data scientist, you're running a PLC, you're dealing with investors, just like you to draw that together and tell me about that journey and not just the advantages, but the issues of actually structuring the business in that way, because it's not an easy thing to do. You know, the direction of travel for us in Diastetics is absolutely to have our therapy teams plug in to Diastetics, or rather we plug into them, I'll put it the other way around. Plugging in means we start that journey with them two years before they launch the drug and stay with them for five years after they've launched the drug. You know, the implication that is that's a permanent or semi-permanent relationship. And so it naturally lends itself to a payment mechanism that will benefit our customers by saying is they can subscribe to the DXRX platform and it will provide an all-you-can-eat service that will provide them the data fix the testing issues on the ground with the lab network and continue to give them the data to monitor how that works. That's a sort of a full end-to-end service. And so it naturally lends itself to plugging in to those therapy teams. So from a customer point of view, we think that's the right way to go. And there's been a lot of early reception to the platform by our customers of subscribing into the platform, initially into the data, because that's what they're familiar with, but over time into the lab engagement services. So the direction of travel for us is clear. The difficulty is you have to have a sufficient supply and product innovation in order to create that level of subscription. So back to the data that we talked about, when we started our data journey some 12 years ago, we were delighted when we were getting data that was six months old. Hey, we can look at what's happening to patients six months ago in their testing journey. We were thrilled when we moved it to quarterly. Obviously, super excited when you couldn't say, we can give you a picture a month old. When you move that to weekly, you are in the critical path of your customer's business. Mm -hmm. Because now what we're able to do is to supply that data through one of our products, which is called Signal, all the way through to the iPhones or the iPads of the pharmaceutical reps on the ground. Now they can walk into a physician or engage a physician and say, not doctor, in the next three to four months, you might see a patient that tests positive on biomarker ABC, but rather, doctor, you may be seeing patients within the last few days. So that precise information, if you'll excuse the pun, that just-in-time information is highly enabling to a pharmaceutical industry that is scarce with its resources. So again, one thinks about that as not as an ad hoc service, but as a routine literally every week delivery. So now all of a sudden we're able to move our customers away from not just an insight to the data, but our dependence upon that data as actually driving the performance of their business on the ground. So what we've been doing with the platform is building that innovation to create that just-in-time management. With our lab engagement services, what we've been saying is don't just hire us to fix the labs, observe how those labs are changing, look at the exhaust data that's coming out of that fix on a weekly or a daily basis. Let's see how many labs have signed up today to improve testing. Here's a couple of labs that we've taken offline because they've fallen beneath the standards that we've set for them. That is a visibility that we're giving to our customers that they've never had before. They've never seen that level of transparency across the system. All of that lends itself to subscription. Now, where are we from an investor point of view? And as I've learned and I'm learning, under promise and over deliver. So what we've attempted to do with our, what we'll call the strategic roadmap, is to lay out with our investors that our expectation of driving a subscription level adoption to a platform should follow the model that others have and we're not going to necessarily break that mold which was you get 20 percent adoption in year one 60 percent adoption in year two and 80 percent adoption in year three if you have the right product okay it's not a slam dunk but if you have the right product what we've seen in our platform in the first full year of it being rolled out was we have moved our business 60 percent of our customers have come on the platform and 35 40 percent of our business has moved to subscription so i think we're on or ahead of the game And I think as we look towards the end of this year and the next couple of years, to us, it's about making sure that the innovation, the product is sitting into the critical path of the customer's business. And from that will come the ability to get the subscription to all the other modules, literally just as a bolt on. So you're subscribing to the platform, but let's add on this module. Now it's ready. It's prime time ready for you. Let's add on this module. It's ready. It's prime time ready for you. And that way, I think we're building the subscription business. So 
clear path for us from a financial standpoint. It's transformative. Um, obviously, that predictable revenue for Diastetics absolutely will drive further innovation. And in fact, as we ended 2022, we announced that we were going to take a quantum of our financial reserves and invest further in that innovation, some £7 million to further invest, driving more data, connecting more data, and accelerating that lab network, only because we see the demand, number one, and number two, the real utility of doing that, which in turn will drive subscription to the business. So it's a clear direction for us. Will everything in Diastetics end up on the subscription? I'm not sure. Our view is that 20% of our business will always remain in that sort of professional services. We are the opinion leaders in the space. Despite the fact we're 160 people strong, we have the hearts and minds of the C-suite of some of the leading companies in the world, and they expect us to think forward for them. So I think there's a part of our business that will always be working with them as an opinion leader and will be priced in a different way. I remember speaking with a lady who was a senior manager within BMS and said, the thing I really like about you at Dastardix is you're thinking about my business when I'm asleep. It's always stuck with me that that's exactly how we should present. We're thinking about their business when they're asleep. We're working in the background to make sure when they wake up in the morning, we're giving them new information, new ability to drive access to those patients with their drugs. You've been on a long journey with diaceutics to this point. You've moved more quickly, more recently to this subscription-based model with the platform. And along the way, you've become a PLC. Can you just talk about your experience of being a PLC? How have you found it? Overall, good. Absolutely putting my flag in the top of the mountain. It's been a good experience. It has provided us with the financial freedom to continue with the journey. It's provided us with the financial freedom to platform eyes and underpin the business with the platform and the financial freedom to continue to invest in the data and the lab network. It's all good. And we have a strong balance sheet. I think our investors are absolutely on point with the mission of the business. I think the the bit that I'm learning is that particularly in the London markets, their understanding of data platform and precision medicine businesses, we have more work to do there. You know, if we were to move Diastetics from its snowy position in Belfast here this morning to Seattle, we would have a very, very different value profile around diastetics. Now, that doesn't matter right at this minute in time because it's not hindering our ability to drive the business, but it will matter in the long run. And so I think one of the things that I need to do and we're working on is to try and communicate better why what we're doing is not just another tech play in healthcare for pharma. Of course, it is that, but it is actually a really important seed or seedling of a business the moment when the pharmaceutical industry is transforming its business model. That, I think, is something that I think there's a work in progress. And ultimately, what that hopefully will end up is that investors will see that our peer value to the extent that the level of data that we have and the level of global influence we have with the lab network are representative companies that have a much higher value than we have in the US. I'm not for uprooting us, don't get me wrong, but the realist in me recognizes that there's more work to be done there. Well, you touch on a very hot topic at the moment in terms of the London market as a venue for public companies more widely. And we can all talk about whether it's the knowledge base of the investors, whether it's the institutional structures, whether it's cultural differences, but it comes down to value. And if markets are allowed to operate, valuations eventually will adjust. And one way they adjust in our market is that if the market you're in doesn't value you or anybody else the way other people value you, then things happen and companies no longer remain independent in those situations. So the next question I had for you is, I mean, directly like you, but companies in this space, such as Huntsworth, UDG, in the London market have been snapped up over recent years. What are the prospects for diastutics to remain independent over the medium, longer term? It's a really tough question to answer. 
the smart executive in me wants to say, look, we're just going to focus on driving our business and the rest will look after itself. I come back to this strategic nexus where we are in Dasinix. We're at a really important place at a really important moment in time. And of course, I am sure we're attracting the attention of large companies that are trying to figure out how to break into precision medicine with a meaningful technology play. So I can see that we're probably in the crosshairs. However, at the end of the day, what I think myself and our horizon plan, we have a horizon plan within Dastix that we drive to, is very much focused on driving our next milestone for us is a billion dollar value business, i.e. that we can see the line to revenue growth over the next four or five years and we can see the road to value accretion in that period. And I think that is the internal focus. I'll let others in the industry figure out as to whether they feel that we can do that in partnership with others. And I think that would be probably my preference is that if there are large players out there that want to get into the place, come and partner with us. I think that's a really good step, builds confidence. And there's lots of precedents for that as well. You know, Roche taking partnerships with Foundation, with Flatiron were always really good steps for those businesses. I think that's probably more likely for us. And it would make sense, I think, from a point of view of driving the mission. That's an admirable ambition, Peter. What are the risks on that journey? What keeps you awake at night? Actually, I fall asleep really, really quickly. (laughs) Just close your eyes and get to sleep. I do waking up early. My team around me would say that I'm probably one of the most impatient people they know. I'm always asking the questions about how fast, how quick, when. So maybe the thing that keeps me awake in the morning is are we doing enough quickly enough to stay ahead of a posse that I think is coming behind us of businesses that are looking enviously at the precision medicine paradigm and saying we want a part of that? That's probably where I think the risks lie. Having said that, we are probably far enough in advance, and one should never say that with complete confidence, but we're far enough advanced in having built the data repositories, the global lab network, or all things that you cannot just throw money at and it will switch on tomorrow morning. You have to really work and mine, if you like, in order to make sure that those things are in the right place, that infrastructure that I talked about. I think for me, sort of the risks, if you like, of our business are much more about how quickly can we get to that peak impact in the business. So who's in that posse? Is it the CROs? Is it other people we've never heard of? I think it's the same names. Think of some of those businesses that have built huge pharma-facing tech businesses on the R&D side, and they're looking over the wall at the commercial side, and they're saying, who's here? Who's in this space? Who are the innovators in the commercial side of the space? And you'll have noted when we describe diastatics, I don't say we're a life science play. I say we're a diagnostic commercialization business. A deliberate choice of word to say that we're working at the particular part of the neighborhood, which has been the least innovated in the space. And I'm very proud of that. So those that I think have saturated their business on the R&D side are probably the ones that are looking over the wall and saying, how do we make a play onto the commercialization front? And I think that's where you need a different style of business. We focused on precision medicine because new drugs are coming to the market with new test needs. It's a really good tip of the spear place to be. I think, as I say, I think we're out in front, but I'm pretty sure that it's those legacy pharma-facing tech service businesses that think about this and say, what's the right way in? What advice would you give to someone who's thinking of starting their own business in this field? Or what advice would you give your younger self where it possible? I think for me, the key thing I take away from or go back and say to my younger self is don't be afraid to lead by example. You know, around in Dastardix, one of the things I'm most proud of is the culture of the company. Now, every CEO talks about the culture of their business. I'd be the first to admit that in building the business plan of Dastardix, and actually, I will confess, there was never a business plan. There was nothing on paper. It was an organic, what does the customer want business. But had there been a business plan, culture wouldn't have been on that plan. I didn't see it. Of course, I intuited that you need a culture, but I didn't see the importance of it. Today, 
we have a business team that is really focused on the mission of our business, which is better testing and giving every patient the ability to be tested the right way. And when I look around the people that we've hired and the people that we've retained are largely the ones who believe passionately in that mission. And so I think for me, what I didn't see then that I do see now, and that is what I've managed to do is lead by example. I've lent into that mission. I've said that it is a singular part of what we want to do. And whilst I know we need to sustain that with investors and building a sustainable business, the real purpose of Diastetics is to change patients' lives. We are doing that. We can see that we're making that difference. So don't be afraid to lead by example. I think that's what I would have said to myself. It's an enormous privilege to be able to take a white piece of paper and turn it into a business. It doesn't happen all the time. And sometimes you falter along the way, but it is an enormous privilege. I think about that privilege every single day. And it's a real driver for me that I've been fortunate to arrive at this place. And with that comes responsibility, but it is a privilege. So for others, if you're brave enough to try it, and I would encourage those budding entrepreneurs to try it, it brings enormous rewards to the individual. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. And Padraig, thank you so much for your informed questioning. Diasutics is definitely on my watch list. I think it's a fascinating area. You certainly have admirable ambition for good reason. And I wish you all the best. And I'll be following your progress and the company's progress with great interest. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Porik. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode of In the Company of Mavericks, please subscribe at our website, inthecompanyofmavericks.com, where we would appreciate your feedback and any suggestions you might have for future episodes.